Last week, the cycling season kicked off with the 64th edition of Paris-Nice. American Bobby Julek continued his success at this race and clocked the fastest time in the opening day prologue, propelling himself into the first leader's yellow jersey. But on the flat stages, it was nothing less than complete domination by Belgian powerhouse Tom Boonen. He's taken three stage wins this week and displayed bursts of speed that nobody else can challenge. The decisive move of the week came from American Freud Land as he attacked on stage three to climb his way into the overall lead. He'll look to try and keep that lead as more mountains confront the riders on today's final stage. Cyclism Sunday's coverage of stage seven of Paris-Nice is up next on OLN. Côte d'Azur, the riders have waited to see this for eight days, having left Paris behind them, and finally they've reached it, the Mediterranean coast. Hello everybody, I'm Paul Sherwin, joined by Bob Roll for stage seven of this year's Paris-Nice, and finally the 135-kilometre route around Nice is going to be a very difficult one for everybody here. But it's one that may well decide the outcome for a man by the name of Floyd Landis, who leads this event by nine seconds. But before we go to the action, let's just have a look at how the story's unfolded. It all started eight days ago with the prologue time trial, 4.8 kilometres around the very heart of Paris. And Bob, Andre Kashekin led a very strange early lead. Andre Kashekin, one of the first riders to go off, and it took Bradley McGee, one of the last riders to go off, to barely get close to him. But it was only one man, the last man to start, defending champion of Pyrenees American, Bobby Julek, taking the stage win by just .71 of a second away from Kashekin. Great result from the American on the Danish squad CSC. But when it was rounded up, he was given a one-second advantage over Kashekin and a two-second advantage over Bradley McGee. But for Bobby Julek, he got himself the first yellow and white jersey. It was a different ball game, though, out onto the open roads. The first stage from Villemondeur to saint amand moron was a long stage of almost 190 kilometers. And Bob, out on the course, Tom Bonin was showing us just why he is the world champion. Defending the rainbow stripes as world champion very, very adequately. Tom Boone, and sometimes we talk about the curse. No such situation this year. Tom Boone, and absolutely demolishing the other sprinters in this field. Alan Davis sneaking in there for second place. Well, I think the important thing to remember is it was actually the first time a world champion has won a stage of Paris-Nice since 1980, and that was Jan Raas. And the 10-second time bonus gave Tom Bonin the overall lead. The next day was another long stage, Cerilli to Belleville, almost 200 kilometers, 124 miles of racing through the Beaujolais. And despite a long, almost race-long break by Nicolas Crosby with a 27 and a half minute advantage, it was still Tom Bonin showing us a fast set of wheels. Matteo Tosato pulling off there, the Tom Bonin teammate. Tom Bonin now in the yellow jersey of race leader. Alan Davis getting a little bit closer this time, but no one can stop the torpedo from Belgium, Tom Bonin. Well, the big story of the day and the sad story of the day, I suppose, had to be on the shoulders of Nicolas Crosby because he came in last on the stage as Tom Bonin made this his win number nine of the season. Crosby, having led the race by 27 and a half minutes, came into the day plum last. But at the top of the leaderboard, still in the yellow and white jersey, Tom Boonen, now looking almost unbeatable. But for Crosby, his day was not coming to nothing because he got himself the lead in the King of the Mountains classification. Well, very reminiscent of 12 months ago, the snow was on the side of the road and the long stage from Julianas to Saint-Étienne was going to be a decider with the Col de Croix de Chabouret right at the end. Despite the abandon of two of his teammates, Floyd Landis, Bob, was showing us why he's possibly the next Lance Armstrong. Floyd Landis absolutely destroying the field. You can see him just pedal away from Schleck and Sammy Sanchez there. The only man capable of staying on his wheel was Pachi Vila from the Lamprey squad, the Spaniard from the Basque Country, getting a good stage win for himself. He didn't do a lick of work in the breakaway. He got a few boos for that, but Floyd Landis becomes your overall leader. What a great ride by the American on the Swiss Phonak squad. Floyd Landis second on the stage, but into the race leader's jersey. 
Simon Pachivilla was the man to cross the line in first place. And what a stage it was, too. 46 kilometers an hour, the average speed. But with the time bonuses and the time gaps, Floyd Landis got himself the overall lead by nine seconds, and Sammy Sanchez more than a minute behind. Stage four was still a very difficult stage from Santa Chen to Rasto, moving down towards almost the outskirts of the Mont Ventoux, and finally the sun arrived. And finally, again in a race that was dominated by, by a long breakaway, Tom Boonen had a little mechanical incident on the way down to the finish, and it looked, Bob, as if he was going to get beaten. Boonen in the green jersey there. Looks like his gear slipped. He almost crashed his bike, but he was able to regain his composure and still come around Alan Davis for the win. Unbelievable power from Belgian Tom Boone. And you can see now in the replay, his chain slips, his back wheel comes up off the tarmac, but that could not slow him down. Tom Boone, a little shake of the head, thanking that he didn't come to grief before he could do his sprint and win the stage. Well, stage five, another beautiful day for the riders on the way from Avignon to Digne-les-Bains. Long stage again, 202 kilometers of racing, and it was a little bit lumpy, but it was all going to be that big climb at the end, the Col de Courbin. A long breakaway, and the man who instigated was here, Joachim Rodriguez, and used Postuma, a win over stage last year in this event. And towards the top of the Col de Courbin, this man was trying to break clear, Joachim Rodriguez, and he held on down towards the finishing line. Great stage win by Jordi Joaquim Rodriguez of his new squad, Ilis Baleares. Good ride there, dropping the last man to stay with him. That was Yus Postuma. Couldn't quite hold the wheel. Postuma winning the stage last year in similar fashion, but this year it's Rodriguez. And here comes the field sprint for third place on the stage. Well, in the middle of that group, you can just see the yellow jersey, and none of the challengers challenged the overall lead of Floyd Landis. And although Rodriguez beat Postuma and Jerome Pinot, it was still Floyd Landis at the top of the overall classification with no change at all in the time gaps. Nine seconds back to Vila, 113 to Sammy Sanchez. Yesterday's stage, another long stage, beautiful stage to follow, and the sun was definitely on the rendezvous. Dean Les Bains to Cannes, 179 kilometers. The race was dominated by a 19-man breakaway, and it all really happened, Bob, when they started to get to the final climb of the day, the Col de Tanneron, and Andre Kashekin broke clear. Andre Kashekin, the hero of the prologue, who nearly won, put this man into second position, David Montcoutier, trying to catch back up to this man, Andre Kashekin. He's the Kazakh rider, teammate of Alexander Vinokurov, and doing a great job getting a stage win. This man is a star of the future. Second on the stage is Sylvain Chavanel, one minute and six seconds in arrears, but no change at all in the overall classification. After six stages of racing, Floyd Landis leads by nine seconds from Pachi Villa. One minute, 13 seconds from Sammy Sanchez, and looking a little bit further down, Eric Decker in ninth, and the American rider Chris Horner right up there in 10th place, a minute and 43 seconds in arrears. But it's all about following the notables. Sandy Kassar is up there in 12th place. Andre Kashekin with that ride is in 27th place. Bobby Julik slipping down a long way from first in the prologue to first 43rd place overall. But today, it's all about the stage here, Bob, around Nice. The stage around Nice, 135 kilometers, that's about 84 miles. Lots of hard climbs, including the Col de Port, the Tour B, and the last climb of Perry Nice, the Col d'Ez, a very tough climb before the finish after 135 days back in Nice. Well, this is what it's all about. 135 kilometers, 84 miles of racing, roughly the distance from San Francisco to San Clemente, which is 87 miles. There's two intermediate sprints today. There are four climbs. In fact, there are two very difficult second, first category climbs towards the end. And the last time the race finished in Nice was last year. And the winner on that occasion was Alejandro Valverde. Well, as we go straight to the action here, we've got an eight-man leading group. None of these riders are at all dangerous in the overall classification to the overall leader, Floyd Landis. But, Bob, I have to say the big news for us is the non-start this morning of Bobby Julik and the abandon early on in the stage of Tom Boonen. Tom Boonen dropping out early, a very mountainous stage today. Doesn't want to spend his legs for the biggest race of the early season, Milano San Remo, in one week's time exactly. That'll be next Sunday, so Boonen dropping out. Bobby Julik dominated this race last year. He's saving himself for later on in the summer, not on great form by his own account, but did win the prologue. So good results for Bobby Julik and could be excused for a day off. Well, this is a leading group of eight riders. They have two minutes and 12 seconds over the front end of the peloton, which of course 
is yellow and green, and that is Team Fonak doing most of the work. Bob, I think what's interesting is that we have three riders from Liberty Seguros in this squad here, Alberto Contador, Aitor Osa, and Sergio Paulino, the man who got himself the silver medal at the Olympic Games. The pressure is seriously on here on the early slopes of the Col de Torbi. Also coming up on today's Cyclism Sundays, highlights from the first four stages of the Pro Tour stage race taking place in Italy right now, Terreno Adriatico. And we'll take a closer look at one of America's hopes in this year's Tour de France, the race overall leader here, Floyd Landis. If I wasn't a pro biker, I would be. Plus the final climb of this year's Paris Nice to Col d'Ez. That's all still to come in today's Cyclism Sundays. Cyclism Sunday's coverage of the Paris-Nice on OLN is brought to you by IBM. What makes you special? Welcome back to Stage 7 of Paris-Nice on OLN, the first major stage race of the season here in France. But also taking place this week is another stage race that's part of the UCI Pro Tour, and that's over in Italy. Let's have a look at the highlights of that race so far. So let's have a look at Terreno Adriatico, which is on the other side of Europe, and Ivan Basso making an appearance, the man who finished second overall last year in the Tour de France, and last year's winner of the Giro d'Italia, Paolo Salvadelli. Everybody looking happy because of the weather down here in this part of the world, and the riders facing the first stage from Tivoli to Tivoli, a circuit race of 104 miles. The race of the two seas from the Tirreno to the Adriatic, the Italian peloton, Filled with uh, energy and color, start of the year. Paolo Bettini, defending Olympic champion. Unbelievable sprint, getting the better of none other than Eric Zabel. After a great lead out from his Milram teammates, it's Bettini getting the win. Stage number one, Tireno Adriatico and the leader's jersey. Look at that sprint by Paolo Bettini. Well, Paolo Bettini judging this to perfection. What a great start it's been for the Quick Step team as well, because this is their number win number 13 of the season. And with that victory, Paolo Bettini becomes the first leader of the race of the two seas. A great win by him. And as we move on to stage two, stage two was a fairly long stage as well, dominated by a very long breakaway, which built up an advantage of seven and a half minutes of one stage on the road from Tivoli to Frascati, 171 kilometers. And it wasn't all fun either for Luca Ascanti, who went down very hard indeed. And Daniele Contrini, Bob, at this point, 200 meters to go, thought he got it won. Daniele Contrini going hard for the finishing line. He made a breakaway from the group. He thought he had it with 200 meters to go. But out of nowhere, it's Paolo Bettini, the Italian champion from the last Olympics in Athens, getting another stage win to consolidate more time on that jersey of race leader of Tirreno Adigatico. Unbelievable sprint by Bettini. Clear daylight between him and the rest of the field. But with that win there, just to have a look at this one more time, there you can see Daniele Contrini. He thought he got it moved, and all of a sudden, leaping out of the pack, the man they call Jiminy Cricket, he's got the advantage there, Bob. This man has got an incredible kick for the start of the season. Fantastic sprint, fresh, looking forward to Milano San Remo in just about a week's time. Paolo Bettini in the race leader's jersey, doing a great stage win. Again, stage number two of Tireno Adriatico, getting the better of Eric Zabel. Once again, Eric Zabel really racking up the second places. That was his eighth second place of the season. Stage three was a little bit different on the road from Avezzano to Pagliette, 183 kilometers. The news, I suppose we have to say, Bob, out on the course, Paolo Bettini crashed, not able to finish, but it was a new name came out of the pack towards the summit. This is Oscar Ferrer sitting in second place the Spanish rider, three times world champion on the Dutch Rabble Bank squad. Around the corner, he can see 75 meters from the finish, and no one can come around. Oscar Frere, he goes into the race leader's jersey because our current leader, Paolo Bettini, crashing out earlier on the stage. That's Igor Astarloa, also a former world champion himself, getting second place on the stage. And Ricardo Rico getting himself third on the stage, but for Oscar Frere, he will don the new leader's jersey. And it's a return to form for him because he hasn't had himself a victory for almost 12 months. Looking very happy with that. The man who I think has had more comebacks in this career in this sport than any other man. On the next day, stage four from Pagliette to Civatinova, Marche, 219 kilometers. And the riders finally getting across to the other side of the peninsula of Italy. A long stage and once again a good stage of racing for all of the riders here. But the race starting without 
The man here, Paolo Bettini, locked up in hospital overnight. And we're wondering now, Bob, whether or not he'll be able to start Milan San Remo. But it was a big punch sprint coming into the finishing town of Civatinova. Civatinova Marche on the other side of the peninsula. There's the lead out from the Milram squad. It's Pataki trying to come around. But look in the green jersey, Tor Hushov, the Norwegian on the French squad. Barely getting the better of Pataki just by a whiff. Couple of crashes, bit of argy bargy throughout the day. And Oscar Frere, the race leader, getting third place on the stage. Well, that was it. Tor Hushov just ahead of Alejandro Pataki and Oscar Frere up there in third place will keep him at the top of the overall classification. With 14 seconds advantage ahead of Alessandro Balan, 14 seconds ahead of Luca Mazzanti, Davide Rebellin up there in fourth place. But looking further down, these are the notables. Uh, Levi Leipheimer in 21st, Paolo Salvadelli in 22nd, Tommy Danielson up there in 25th, and Hincapi 26th. Alessandro Pataki quite a long way down in 45th place. Well, in fact, a few moments ago at the front end of the main field, it was mainly dominated by the riders of Team Fonac. But it's interesting to note now, there's a few orange jerseys of Uskatel Uskadi moving to the front. They don't have a man in that leading group of eight riders, which is now down to just eight riders. Or should I say, it looks like it's going to be down to seven riders very shortly because the man at the back here is David Moncouche, who just a little earlier in the day got himself 10 points at the top of the Col de la Porte. And that will give him, by the end of today, the lead in the King of the Mountains classification. Well, Floyd Landis is comfortably in the main field, but Bob, as I say, we're looking here at Contador, Osa, Paulino, Marcus Seberg, which is interesting to see him riding well. In the black jersey, you'll notice Joachim Rodriguez, Mate Mugali in the lime green jersey of Liki Gas, Jose Luis Arieta, and of course, Moncouche just on the back. But again, it's very interesting to see that in this early part of the season, Liberty Seguros are very present with three men in this group. They've done well so far today, placing three men in what might turn out to be the winning breakaway. And that is good odds when you have three out of eight. It's always good for the team director in the car behind to have three men in the breakaway, especially one as strong as the man just in front of Moncoutier. That's Alberto Contador, one of the best climbers in the business. It's a very hilly stage, but it's not guaranteed that this breakaway will succeed. Big pressure in the main field by the Phonak squad. They've done the tempo throughout the week since American Floyd Landis got the leader's jersey and also being helped by Uskatel Uskei in the orange jerseys of uh, the Basque squad that wants to win today's stage. Well, the riders here are making their way up towards the summit of the Col de la Tourbi, which is at 90 kilometers into the race. They'll descend down to the finish line in Nice and then start the final climb of the day, the Col d'Ez. There's still an awful lot of climbing left to do on today's stage. You're watching OLN Cyclism Sunday's coverage of the 64th edition here of Paris-Nice. We're on the final stage into Nice. Let's take a minute to update ourselves on all of the jerseys the leaders are wearing in the race to this point. Obviously, Floyd Landis has the yellow jersey of leadership. Tom Boonen started the day in the green jersey, but that's likely to go at the end of the day to Sammy Sanchez. Christophe Laurent is leading the King of the Mountains classification. Luis Leon Sanchez of Liberty Seguros is the best young rider. And Discovery Channel have a very tentative lead in the team classification. Floyd Landis looking good in yellow, but the King of the Mountains jersey up for grabs, being led by Christophe Laurent so far, with David Moncoutier hot on his heels on the point for the King of the Mountains. So the lead is here. Look at that little bit of discussion. That's Marcus Seberg on the right-hand side there in the pale blue jersey of Gerestein. Just encouraging these riders to keep working. It certainly isn't, Bob, yet the time to start attacking, as we can see here, just going off the back, Moncoutier. Moncoutier, I suppose, happy with his day, but this really is rather silly tactics when they've still got two minutes off the front end of the main field. A bit of a knucklehead maneuver here by Moncoutier, just sitting on. Alberto Contador deciding that's it. Everybody's going to work. Now he's trying to get back across. This is an incredible waste of energy here. And it's because Moncoutier either is too tired to cooperate with the work up in the front or doesn't want to and he wants to sit on. So this is a good way to uh, lose a lot of momentum in the breakaway. Don't do this. Don't try this at home, people. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Bob. To me, that is a very amateurish move. It was Moncoutier who actually started the aggression after about 15 kilometers. He was joined at 40 kilometers by two other riders, Mate Mugali and Jose Luis Arieta. But to sit on the back like this, I really find that rather a shame because Moncoutier has been an aggressive rider throughout the whole of this week's Paris-Nice. Yes, absolutely, Moncoutier trying to win that King of the Mountains jersey that he did last year in Paris-Nice uh, as best or most consistent climber of the race. The strongest rider so far in the whole field has been American Floyd Landis. Here's the rest of the riders in the breakaway. 
When you have three men on the same team like Liberty Seguros does, oftentimes the other riders in the break from the different teams do not want to cooperate, and we see the situation that we had with uh, probably the man that Liberty Seguros is protecting, and that would be Alberto Contador for the stage win, but uh, when Moncoutier is just sitting on there, it makes it a little bit frustrating for the other riders in the break. This is Rodriguez sitting on the back. I wonder if going through the mind of David Moncoutier is the fact that a Frenchman has never won a stage here at Paris-Nice, Bob, since the year 2002. That was an awful long time ago. They're not really having much fun in their own races, are they? <laughs> they are most certainly not of international cycling coming to the birthplace of cycling, but riders from all over the world now competing, and uh, it's interesting to see that the homegrown riders from the French peloton struggling to win on home soil many times throughout the year and and they've hired riders from all over the world on the French team so the teams have a chance to win it's just the French riders themselves that are having a hard time nowadays. Not very many French riders in the top 100 ranking and that's completely different to the strength of American cycling which is unbelievable at the moment we'll be really following a lot of American progress throughout this year but it's great to see the start of the season Floyd Landis already with a win under his belt in the Tour of California a very dominant win and in fact leading this race by a mere nine seconds now Bob there are time bonuses out on the course there's 10 seconds for the first rider to cross the line but I think basically Floyd Landis barring an accident has got it pretty much sewn up his team has ridden incredibly well and Floyd Landis himself demolishing the field on stage number three into Saint Etienne with a long hard climb before the finish but Floyd absolutely crushing the field putting big time into all of his rivals except one man Francisco Pachivila was able to stay on his wheel and he won the stage the day that Floyd took the leader's jersey but great riding by the California on the Phonak Swiss squad Floyd Landis having a great season so far well, as we look at the survivors of this year's Paris-Nice, this week on Survivor Wednesdays, a Survivor first. A new tribe is composed entirely of eliminated castaways. And Johnny Fairplay starts the anti-Rupert gossip. Survivor Wednesdays, three back-to-back -back episodes of Survivor. Pearl Islands, beginning at 7. This leading group of eight riders now seem to have returned to a normal sense, and they're taking turns setting the pace at the front. We're around about one and a half kilometers from the summit of the Col de la Tourbie, and then it's a long descent down into the outskirts of Nice, and Bob, the time is actually starting to come down, so this might not be the winning move this afternoon. Not, might not be, it's a big, big competitive field, everyone together behind this breakaway, being led by the Fonac and Euskatel squads now, Floyd Land is the leader, Euskatel looking for stages, and Iles Barial is putting three men in the breakaway, but that might not be enough because of the pressure coming from the telephone. Well, we're now looking at about a kilometre and a half to the summit. We'll take a very short break, and when we come back, we'll go over the top of the Col de la Torbi. Well, look at this. A very good move here coming from Marcus Zeberg, riding for Team Gerolsteiner. Gerolsteiner themselves have had a very good start to the season. Levi Leipheimer winning the prologue of the Tour of California around about two weeks ago. This, Bob, is a very strange move on the slopes of the climb here because behind in that group there are still three riders from Liberty Seguros. One would be surprised and amazed if this, work, if this move worked. It uh, depends on how much work that uh, Marcus Aberg has done so far in the breakaway. He's taking his turns, and we'll see if the Liberty Seguros riders can react. And uh, Marcus Aberg in the meantime. And here's a move right now by Contador trying to get across to the wheel of Marcus Aberg. The other riders looking at each other a little bit. This is an advantageous situation now for Liberty Seguros because the riders that chase down their man Contador, who's chasing him, the other two, that would be Paulino and Osa, will have a chance to sit on. We'll see how far up the road Marcos Zabera can get with this big, powerful attack he's just put in. Well, if this man can get to the summit of the climb ahead of the others, he's a very good descender. In fact, he's much better known as a, as a sprint, sprint finisher. There you can see the little bit of... Uh, jiggery pokery going on at the back there because riders all over the road trying to see who's going to react to the move there by the Liberty Seguros rider and, and I think a lot of this Bob is coming from the fact that David Moncouche is not doing a lot and there to give you a bit of a perspective is the main field the last official time check we had was a minute and 58 seconds but I think by the summit of this climb it's going to be a little bit less than that yes I believe so and Marcus Zaberg up the road here we see uh, a second chase group being started by the rider from FDJ the French squad a big international flavor to it, including the Australian Bradley McGee did so well in the prologue. It was uh, slowed down, I think, a little bit by the rain when he was riding out on course. Eric Leblacher from the French squad 
Francaise Dudu trying to get across to the breakaway, but they're still about a minute and a half up the road from the peloton, and he's just in between the two groups in a bit of no man's land there, but a nice little attack by the FTJ rider. Not really a sensible move when you know there's two very strong teams on the front end of the main field. You've got Uscatel Uscadillo trying to whip it all up, and of course Team Fonak have been putting the hammer down for the last 20 or 30 kilometers to make sure that break doesn't get too far off the front. But this is the move as we head up to one kilometer from the summit of the Col de Torbi. It was Marcus Zuberg, and these are the chases. And Bob, I think the Liberty Seguros rider is just dangling off the front still. Just in, just in front of this group, Rodriguez asking the other riders in the breakaway to cooperate and bring Marcus Zuberg back into the fold. He's just behind, and there uh, you might see Moncuchie finally come to the front to get some more King of the Mountain points. And uh, he's just got about 800 more meters before the top of this climb with his group. Three Liberty Seguros riders, there's Sergio Paulino just on the back, and uh, the strong Portuguese rider had a brilliant Olympic Games where he finished second to Paolo Bettini in the breakaway. So uh, he's riding well again. It's been a long time since we've seen him in the front group. Well, the team that Luigi Seguros brought here to Paranese was one of the development squads, the team that they're looking after to ride well in the latter part of the season. We go a little bit further up. Not much of an advantage now for Marcus Zuberg, maybe 40 or 50 meters. I think, Bob, once we begin this descent, it will all come back together. The Col de la Torbi at 485 meters, but Liberty Seguros do not want anything going off the front without one of their men being there, because I'm sure the team manager won't be very happy if the break goes clear. Look at Moncuche, just riding for himself. He's coming through now. He wants to get some points still, and uh, he's got a couple of guys to chase down. They're just coming over the top of the climb now. One big climb still to go over the Col Dez. That's just on the outskirts of Nice. These two riders now having a little bit of a struggle. That's Arieta as well as Mate Mujeli having a hard time staying in the front group. But only a few hundred meters now to the summit of this climb, and I think it will come back together on the descent. Well, Moncouche not making himself very many friends in this group here because he's just accelerating, sitting on the back all of the time. I know it's been a long, hard stage race for, for the French here, and he's trying to get himself a victory if he can as we go to the summit of the climb. Maximum points on this first category climb here. There we are. The Col de la Torbi, 45 kilometers to go, and I wonder if David Moncouche is going to get himself a few more points. Again, that is Rodriguez, Joachim Rodriguez going off the front, and he's not happy at all with Moncouche just sitting on the back, getting himself fourth place, Bob, and a few more points, and probably consolidating his lead in that King of the Mountains classification, the competition in which he started off today in second place. bit of a pause and still Marcus Seberg he's doing a brilliant ride here just holding off the front and Rodriguez is going to be the first man to catch him Ted de la Course if you can just see that graphic there that's the front end of the bike race and these leading group of eight men have around about a minute and 45 seconds over the rest of the main field Marcus Seberg they're still making tempo but I think he's going to be joined here momentarily by the rest of the riders in the breakaway going off the front getting maximum points on the king of the mountain beautiful images a gorgeous day for a bike race way down here in the Côte d'Azur, the Mediterranean. Very beautiful climate for the bike racers, and uh, look at how steep these climbs are. Very tough day for the riders, but for the people on the beach, quite a lovely afternoon. <laughs> Magnificent. That's why they call this race the Race to the Sun. We started off in a very cold climatic conditions in the north in Paris. We've moved down right through the very heart of the country to this magnificent backdrop. Here we take a right turn at La Tourby and drop down into the outskirts of Nice. If you take a left turn here at the top of this climb, you would find yourself going down into Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo, do a little bit of gambling. Also, if you waited around a few days, you could just go over the border and watch the finish of Milano San Remo, the first big classic of the year. Well, with the main field now also going over the summit of that climb, it's all very much on the race here as we head down towards Nice and the riders will cross the finish line and then face one final lap around a little circuit of about 25 kilometers, which includes the Col d'Ez. Welcome back to the final stage of this year's Paris-Nice. American Floyd Landis is leading the race, but there are plenty of other Americans we want to keep track of during the season. Let's take a minute now to catch up with the rest of the notable American cyclists. As we said, Floyd Landis is the leader. Bobby Julik was 43rd overall, having winning the opening prologue, but he hasn't actually started the final stage. Chris Horner from David to Monlado. He's 10th overall, hanging tough in Perry Nice. Fred Rodriguez having a little bit of a tough time. His teammate on the Lotto squad, he didn't finish stage three of the Tirreno Adriatico. 
Well, Christian van der Velde, Team CSC, having a bit of bad luck, crashing out of Paris on stage two, and Dave Zabriskie wasn't able to finish the sixth stage. Big George Hincapie of the Discovery Channel cycling team is fourth place on stage number four down in Tirreno, currently 26th overall, and Tommy Danielson, his teammate, 25th overall in Tirreno. They're looking forward to the time trial. Well, Levi Leipheimer from Gerolsteiner, he's 21st overall in Tirreno Adriatico, but he's got a good chance to move up because there's an individual time trial coming up. And let's not forget, we'll keep track on all of these riders throughout the year. And next week, don't forget, George Hincapie will be taking a serious look at Milan San Remo. Well, just around the corner there, you can see Marcus Seberg has made a very fine move on the last kilometre of the Col de la Tourbie there, Bob, and it really has caused a bit of consternation in this group. That is the leading group. These men here that we're looking at, they really have been caught out. Aitor Osa, they're sitting on the back, the Spanish climber on the Liberty Seguro squad, joined by Maddie Mujerli, as well as Jose Luis Arieta being dropped by our leaders, including David Moncoutier consolidating his lead in the King of the Mountain on the last climb. And, uh, and there is Sergio Paulino just at the front. Also his teammate Alberto Contador, maybe the strongest man on the Liberty Seguro squad here at Perignese and trying for a stage win today. Well, it's a long time since the French have won a stage, and I wonder if that's what David Moncouche is thinking about. In fact, it's a long time since the French have actually won Paris-Nice, because the last man to win was the great Frenchman, one of the greatest Frenchmen of recent years, Laurent Jalabert. And he won this race back in 1997. That's an awful long time ago. Nearly a decade of a drought in France for the wins here in uh, Paris-Nice. Such an international sport now, it's tough for the French riders to continue winning on home soil. It certainly is. These three riders, uh, there won't be any help at all now given by uh, Osa at the back there. He's not worried at all because he's got two men in that leading group. The split now is five riders off the front and three riders chasing to stay in contact. And there you can just see the front end of the main field. And in that main field, comfortably with a nine-second lead at the start of the day, Floyd Landis. And Bob, just looking down there from uh, what was a large field at the start of the day, I think we've seen a, a certain number of dropouts. Yes, we have. We've seen a lot of riders uh, trying to rest their legs after a very tough week of racing. Freezing cold temperatures early in the week, and those have given way to a beautiful day of sunshine. Yuskatel Yuskidi on the front of the bike race now, helping Fonak a little bit, trying to bring this breakaway back in the fold. And I think we're going to see some big attacks from the riders on Yuskatel Yuskidi on the last climb of the day, the cold des. Floyd Landis now just one more climb that he needs to get over to win Perry Nice, assuming that uh, Pachi Vila doesn't get the stage win in the 10 second time bonus at the finish line. Well, from the sunshine of southern France to the snows of the north, beginning March 18th on OLN, see the last great race on earth. One musher, 12 sled dogs across 1,200 miles of frozen rivers, deadly cliffs, and the most dangerous Alaskan tundra. The Iditarod on OLN, presented by Cabelas, Saturday, March 18th through April the 4th. This is actually the little town of Ez that the riders will come through in a few moments' time. It's a fairly precarious descent, but actually I think those three riders, if they take a few risks on these corners, they just might make it. Grifko, Liblasher trying to get across. They are just in front of the peloton, so uh, in no man's land for the two riders. And uh, here we go back up to the breakaway. Rodriguez on the front with Marcus Zuberg taking some chances. Three riders behind, including Arieta and Mujerli, trying to bridge up to the breakaway that they were in originally. 41, just over kilometers to the finish line, and one big climb of the Col Des. They'll come back through this village before they get to the finish line in Nice. Well, this is a very fast descent here. You can see the referee's car just behind them, and those three chasers are not far behind that, but you have to be so careful on the Côte d'Azur when you're racing. There's so many of these strange directional islands, and these riders are really on the edge of the limit all of the time. Well, i tell you one thing. I have to say that he's in cruise control, and it shows he's got great form this week at Paris-Nice. But when we come back, we're going to have a closer look at an American by the name of Floyd Landis. My main goal is the Tour de France. Welcome back to Olen's coverage of Paris-Nice, where American Floyd Landis has been very impressive, and he also now looks solid to win the overall competition. Bob Roll has a little bit more about this new American star. Once a support rider on U.S. Postal to help Lance Armstrong win the Tour de France, American Floyd Landis has overcome initial team struggles with the Swiss-based Phonak squad. 
He has flourished in his role as team leader, evolving into one of the premier cyclists in the world. A time trial specialist and a strong climber, the junior national mountain bike champion turned pro with the domestic team Mercury in 1999. He moved to U.S. Postal in 02, where he had his breakout season, finishing second in the Dauphiné Libre and started in his first Tour de France. He peaked in 2004, winning the Volta Algarve and taking the leader's jersey at the Tour of Spain for 11 days. In 2005, he changed to the green and yellow colors of Team Phonak, who quickly found themselves on shaky ground after the Tyler Hamilton controversy. As a result, Landis inherited the role of team leader. The 30-year-old rose to the occasion for his new team with a ninth place finish at the 2005 Tour de France, his highest finish ever. This season, Floyd has his eyes on one goal. My main goal is the Tour de France. We will go there with the best team we have, and we will do whatever we can to try to win the Tour de France. So far, things look to be on track. He is fresh off of a solid performance in the inaugural Tour of California, where he took the Stage 3 time trial win and the overall race title. And now he finds himself again on top of his game as overall leader here at Paris Nice. It's a long season, but there is no doubt Floyd Landis is enjoying his time on the bike. If I wasn't a pro biker, I would be a pro bowler. The kingpin of Phonak maintains a positive outlook, and the laid-back Californian's future is filled with optimism. Landis is motivated, fit, and should be watched closely this season as the countdown to the Tour de France gains momentum. Well, thanks, Bob, but it was good to see Floyd Landis in California, and now it's also good to see him riding well here at Paris-Nice. Well, it looks as if this leading group of eight riders is all back together, but a few scary moments there for a couple of riders who were caught out. One of them, Aitor Osa, but he's just managed to get himself onto the back there with the man from Leaky Gas, who is Mate Mugeli. I remember this descent, Bob, from last year where Contador nearly actually came unstuck because his foot came out from halfway down, and I don't know how he managed to keep himself upright, and this is Contador right now. Quite the acrobat when it's necessary. The bike riders have incredible skills at handling the bike some more than others, and Contador nearly coming down hard on this very same descent. Maybe that'll give him an extra rush of adrenaline while he tries to stay in the front group with his two teammates, Aitor Osa and Sergio Paulino. Liberty Seguro is doing a great job today placing three men in the breakaway, but here's the main field under the impetus of the Uscatel Uscati squad, as well as Floyd Landis, the American on the Swiss Phonak squad. His teammates have been doing the tempo for the majority of the week, and the peloton hesitating not one moment to throw everything they have at Floyd Landis, but Floyd riding so strong, he's been able to defend the race lead against the attacks from so many riders in the peloton. Great job by Floyd Landis. After incredible success at the Tour of California, he's come to Paris Nice with incredible form, obviously, and uh, wasted no time on stage three. The first big mountains of the season for the peloton, Floyd absolutely demolishing the field. Well, in the overall classification, let's not forget the man who starts the day in the lead course is Floyd Landis with a nine second advantage over Pachi Javier Villa of Team Lampre. Sorry about the little bit of picture breakup but these are live pictures coming from France. Up there as well, well overall is Sammy Sanchez and in fact Sammy Sanchez of Uscatel Uscadi Bob has taken the uh, lead in the green jersey points classification with the abandon early today by Tom Boonen. I'm not really supposed surprised that Tom Boonen has abandoned because after all this wasn't the sort of course that Tom would have enjoyed, is it? <laughs> well, he's so powerful, and he is a very large man for a cyclist. That gives him incredible power in the sprints. But on the climb, of course, you have to pay the price for that, uh, the, all of that speed and uh, agility that Tom Bonin has. He is desperate to win Milano San Remo in one week's time from today. And so I think that uh, to save his legs for the big spring classic to begin the cycling season, Bonin has abandoned Paris Nice, explaining to the cameras earlier in the day he'd rather win Milan San Remo than finish Paris Nice. Well, caution being thrown to the wind here by this leading group of eight riders. They still are trying to split the group. This might not be the ideal place to do it as we're coming through the little town now of Villefranche. That's around about five kilometers from the finish line at Nice. 
but when they cross the finish line they will still have to go out and climb over the Coldez once again. Not surprising at all to see Liberty Seguros trying to get themselves the win on this final stage. And let's not forget, they're actually in a very good situation too because the leading team at the start of the day in this year's Paris-Nice was of course the Discovery Channel team, only with a 15 second advantage over Team Lamprey and only 21 seconds over Liberty Seguros. Now if we stop the race right now, Bob, Liberty Seguros would win the team prize and that's important for the Spanish teams. The Spanish teams always competitive, they love to be the first team. Here we see the monkey business going around along in the breakaway. This rider, Arieta, was just dropped on the last climb and now he's trying to bridge across to the, I think it was Alberto Contador, the Liberty Seguros rider, who made the first attack. They missed out on the breakaway of Marcus Zberg and I think the team director had a word with the riders. This might be Sergio Parlo, excuse me. Aitoros is the listed rider. He was off the back a little bit himself just a few kilometers ago. So the team manager of Liberty Seguros following the race saying, look, fellas, you missed out on the Zaber attack. I don't want that to happen again. And well, you better start attacking yourselves. Well, that is Rodriguez going there. And they're all leaping across in ones and twos. And it's a very big game of poker going on here, Bob. And I think Liberty Seguros are playing their hand here with David Moncouche forcing him to chase all of the moves. Now, Moncouche is in a strange position because a couple of days ago, in fact, it was uh, the fourth stage of the race, he was complaining bitterly that all of the riders were sitting on his wheel, and today he's been sitting on them. It swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Oh, yes, if the uh, bike racers' memories are long, and uh, this rider here from Louis Segros won't care anything about that. It's not four kilometers to the finish. That will be the next lap that they come around and uh, they'll have about 25 k's to go so about 30 kilometers worth of finish and one big huge climb to cold des before they can do that well the main field is still hovering at around about the two minute mark as we go through 32 kilometers to go we'll take a very short break and see what comes up next for these guys after every star hangs them up someone must fill his shoes the greatest riders in the world are about to collide. And one by one, the contenders will emerge. From the cobblestones of France to the mountains of Italy. Who will be the next king of cycling? Cyclism Sundays, the clash of the contenders. Milan San Remo, Sunday at 5. Brought to you by John Hancock. Sundays on OLN. This week we're covering the opening race of the UCI Pro Tour Paris-Nice here in France. But we'll bring you all of the top races leading up to the Tour de France in July, but next is Milan San Remo, and what a race that's going to be. Milano San Remo is one of the five monumental classics in cycling, the biggest race in cycling crazy Italy. Last year we saw Alessandro Pataki's emotions clear for all eyes to see. On stomping form is Tom Boonen with his teammate Paolo Bettini, the cricket, all of them trying to dethrone Pataki for the biggest one-day race in Italian cycling, Milano San Remo. What a great race it always is. Next Sunday, OLN's at the Milan San Remo Classic, the longest one-day race of the season. Plus highlights from Tirreno Adriatico, it's Cyclism Sundays on OLN. Next Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Well, if you ever get a chance to come down to this part of the world, this is the old port of Nice, and the man we're looking at here is Aitor Osa. Dropped a few moments ago, but now he's on the attack. And as we go back to the main field, these two riders a few moments ago were away. This is Grifco and Le Blacher, where they are now comfortably back in the main field, who in fact, Bob, have drifted back to around about 2 minutes and 50 seconds. Now, I don't think Floyd Landis will be too worried about that because of all of the riders in the breakaway, in fact, the closest man to him is 22nd, 5 minutes and 19 seconds in arrears. So that's not too much of a problem for Floyd at the moment. No, most certainly not. And that would be that man right there, Aitor Osa, on the wheel of Jose Luis Arieta, the AG2 rider. He's a Spaniard on the French squad. The French team's having success here, but not the French riders in uh, years past. It's been a while since they've even won a stage in uh, Paris-Nice. But uh, these two riders, both from Spain, that won't be in their minds at all. They're trying to win the stage. What a magnificent backdrop here. Those yachts you can see in the background, those ships, in fact, are ferries which take people across to the island of Corsica, which is not too far away from here. But what a great backdrop. It's such a difference, isn't it, Bob, to the weather these riders experienced eight days ago when they started with the prologue time trial around Paris. The, the fine weather giving the riders wings. They love to ride in the sunshine here in the south of France. Aitor Osa now being joined by a number of other riders. It looks like Marcos Zeberg and Rodriguez has made the juncture up to the front as well as Alberto Contador 
So Liberty Seguro is still doing a good job controlling things. Aitor Osa setting things up for his teammate Alberto Contador. That's one kilometer to the finish line, but there is a circuit. After they get there, they'll have a good chance to take a look at it. Here's the chasers with Moncoutier. It looks like they've given up a little bit. They've missed the attacks, and uh, that will be a disappointing day. Maybe not for Moncoutier, who is probably going to win the King of the Mountain, but perhaps for these two riders, Paulino as well as Mujerli, have missed out now on the move started by Aitor Osa. Well, they're in fact uh, losing a certain amount of time because they're around about 30 seconds in arrears now. I tell you, that was certainly not the thing to do for David Moncoutier. He needed to be that little bit more attentive. The riders are just a bit further up the road there as they go towards the finish line for the first time. And this is on the very famous Promenade des Anglais. They'll come up to a sprint point, which will give three seconds, two seconds and one second for the first three riders to cross the line. But that's not really going to be all that important, especially as none of these riders are very high up in the overall classification. Now, five leaders, we've got three chasers in around about 15 seconds and the main field almost three minutes in arrears. That's where we are now, right in the very heart of Nice. And Bob, as they cross this finish line, we're looking at 28 kilometres to go to the finish. Well, they're still getting themselves nice and sorted out. You can just see the three chasers in the background. I wonder if David Moncouche has got anything in those legs of his to try and pull it back together. Because once they've crossed through this finish line, they will start very shortly the final climb of this year's Paris de Colders. It's the final climb of the race. And I wonder whether or not Floyd Landis can hold on. Coming up next, the Colders. Welcome back to the concluding stage of the 64th edition of Paris-Nice here on OLN. Well, it's very early in the season and many of these riders use this race to get into shape. Let's take a look at some of the key names of some of the riders who started this race but are no longer with us. Of the 168 riders, by the way, 47 so far have been eliminated. Jason McCartney from Discovery Channel didn't finish the first stage. Christian Vandeveld, a broken collarbone from Team CSC on stage number two. Brad McGee, he didn't get to the end of stage number three, neither do two did Robbie Hunter. Alan Davis from Liberty Seguro, second on a bunch of stages, couldn't quite finish stage number five. And Benjamin Noval, he also was out of the race on stage five. Christophe Moreau from the AG2R squad, the big French star, out of the race on stage number six. And the winner of the prologue of the Tour de France last year, Dave Zabriskie, he didn't finish stage six either. And we are hearing, of course, let's not forget that Bobby Julik didn't start the day today, and of course Tom Boonen did not finish. Bigger fish to fry for those two men later on in the season. It's still early, but the stage racing here at Perry Nice is a fantastic event. Well, just looking here, you can hear the bell. That's an indication they're going to face one final lap of 28 kilometers. The main field have closed in almost a minute on that descent. The last time check we had was 2 minutes and 50 seconds. On the line there, it was 2 minutes and 11 seconds. And Bob, rather interesting to see that Team Discovery Channel are taking their possibility of a win in the team classification here very seriously. Also, they have two men in the top ten. That's Jose Luis Chechu Rubiera and the ace, Jose Azevedo. So maybe uh, setting them up for an attack on the Coldez. I'm sure that uh, the team manager, Johan Brunil, would love to get some results from his Discovery guys. And uh, Azevedo and Rubiera, not too far away from Floyd Landis, just both of them right around a minute and 40 seconds behind on GC. So we might see some attacks now from the Discovery rider. Well, there is the race. We've got a five-man leading group who are about to start the call. There's they're 25 seconds ahead of the three chasers and two minutes, 11 seconds back to the main field, which is now being led by Discovery Channel. A lot of riders, still five riders in there from Team Phonak. Although Floyd Landis has lost a couple of teammates throughout this week, they've done a sterling job for him. Big U-turn here at the end of the Boulevard Anglais, right up against the beach of Nice. And they will come back towards Nice and then go straight up the Col d'Ez. And uh, these are your leaders. The two riders from Liberty Seguros are Contador and Osa. Arieta also making the breakaway there with Marcus Zberg and the rider from Iles Baleares in the black and red. That's Jordi Roquim Rodriguez, very solid climber. He's won lots of good stages, including a stage in the Tour of Spain a couple of years ago. And here now the riders are going to go through the streets of Nice and up the final climb of the day. And we'll see if Floyd Landis can hang on. He's in the peloton. He's been so well guarded by his teammates. One would find it hard to believe that he would be vulnerable to attacks. But I don't think that's going to stop the, the field anyways from doing that. 
Well, after some of the magnificent backdrops we've had of this afternoon stage, it really is a pity we have to go through the back streets of Nice to get to the Coldes. But once we do get up there, we'll have a chance to see the magnificent backdrop again of the Côte d'Azur. It really is magnificent today, but when you think just yesterday it was snowing in the north of Europe, in Belgium and Holland, these riders probably rang home last night and found out that good news, and they're very happy to be here, I think, on the outskirts of Nice. The riders from Belgium, Holland and Germany very pleased to be racing in the sunshine of the Côte d'Azur while the rest of Europe is uh, very cold and snowy. Here's the riders in the peloton and uh, looks like Euskatel Euskadi still coming through making the work as well as Martin Elminger, the Swiss champion on Floyd Landis' Phonex squad. We had a chance to see him do this very same thing and uh, he, he was uh, in the front of the Tour of California for almost a week time and he's had to do the same kind of work here. Floyd Landis racing so well puts a lot of pressure on his teammate doesn't it? Well I see that uh, just popping up there the information coming through your favorite American rider has just abandoned Guido Trenti as the riders here whipping up the pace we're now facing up to what is going to be the final big challenge here in Paris Nice this year for Floyd Landis. He starts this climb with a nine second advantage over Pachi Villa. I wonder if he's going to hold on. We'll take a very short break. Welcome back to Paris Nice on OLN. We're on the final climb and Floyd Landis is that little bit closer to taking the overall win. But let's just take a minute to remind ourselves of the overall situation going into today's stage. Floyd Landis leads the race by nine seconds ahead of Pachi Villa. Sammy Sanchez in third place, a minute 13 down. And then in fourth and fifth place, Antonio Colom and Frank Schleck at a minute 23. And the best rider from Discovery Channel, by the way, is Jose Acevedo. He's sixth at 1.35. So here we are on the very first kilometre now of the Caldez. This is looking like a very serious move by these five riders. Bob, a few moments ago, I thought they were going to get themselves pulled back. And look at the move immediately as we start to go uphill. Joaquim Rodriguez on the right-hand side, immediately marked there by Liberty Seguros. That would be Alberto Contador trying to get on the wheel of Rodriguez. The work done by Aitor Osa across the flats. He'll drop off now. Arietta struggling to ma match that acceleration from Rodriguez. But Marco Seberg still riding strong, getting onto the wheel of Contador. Arietta now struggling himself. Well, it really is an incredible climb. In the old days, this actually used to be an individual time trial. It was on the slopes of this time trial course up the Coldes that the great Sean Kelly always pounded his uh, confirmation on this race. Kelly, who won the race seven years in a row, Mr. Sean Kelly, earned himself the nickname as King Kelly at the start of the season. King of the classic, Sean Kelly, one of the greatest of all time. Hard to imagine he won Perry Nice seven years in a row, but he did do during his heyday in the 80s and early 90s. Sean Kelly, I wonder if he's down there today watching the fireworks now by Alberto Contador and Jordi Rodriguez in the front group with Marcus Zaberg. Well, I tell you what, it really is a very difficult final day for the riders at Paris Nice. They've been over in the early part of the day, the Côte d'Uranus. They've been over the Col de la Porte, and now we've got attack coming after attack. I have a feeling that Liberty Zaguros really want to get this, and it would be really good if a man by the name of Alberto Contador got himself the win here this afternoon, because, Bob, he is a man who's come back from a long way. I had the feeling that Liberty Zaguros were trying to get him in contention to win the stage, they've been working hard for him, his two teammates, Paulino and Osa, throughout the day. Rodriguez matching the acceleration of Contador, and look at the field now, still being led by the Phonak squad. Well, this is a few nervous moments. There's the yellow and white jersey of leadership. That's just in about fifth or sixth position there is Floyd Landis, looking very comfortable indeed. And look at the way Marcus Seberg has pulled himself back into this race. They need to actually keep working because if they start this cat and mouse maneuvering here in the early slopes of the Col des Bob, that main field is going to come back because they will go up this climb like a cat coming out of a bag. Yes, absolutely. They need to keep working together to try to get a bit of an advantage. They're going to need the two minutes that they have plus maybe a little bit more than that if they're going to stay away to the finish line. Contador matching the acceleration by Rodriguez seems to be sitting on. Here he goes again. It's Contador now attacking again. Liberty Seguro setting it up brilliantly for Contador. Rodriguez onto his wheel and Zaberg in trouble again. Well, I tell you that Contador, he must be thinking about the, not the times he's come close to winning this stage. And here this afternoon, he will do everything to try and break the stranglehold of anybody staying in contact. But he cannot get rid of Joachim Rodriguez at all, can he? This man is a very well-educated cyclist. And in fact, he turned professional very early on in his career, but stayed on at university to make sure that he had his 
his education under his belt before then concentrating on being a professional cyclist. And this, Bob, I have to say, has been a great week for him. Well, the main fields certainly are going all out now. I wonder if this Lamprey move here is trying to set something up for Villar because Villar is only nine seconds off the overall lead of Floyd Landis. Landis leads Pachi Villar from Spain and from Lamprey by nine seconds at the start of the day. I'm sure Floyd will have taken very good note of who is going off the front here, but for him, it's an important seven kilometers. This is the most important seven kilometers for Floyd Landis throughout the week. He needs to stay on the wheels of his teammates. That might be Vila himself, the Lamprey rider. And if he starts attacking, he only needs nine seconds, that's all, from Floyd Landis to overtake him in the, the leader's jersey. And that would be a very sad way for Floyd to end Perry Nice by losing uh, the lead to the, to anybody else in the field so he just has a few more kilometers of climbing with his teammates still intact there you can see it's a rider from the Discovery Channel cycling team on the front of the peloton chasing down this Lamprey man and let's see if Floyd Landis needs to come out and attack here's our two leaders Contador and Rodriguez that's the front of the bike race at the moment well, that's the front of the bike race and being joined by Marcus Seberg. They really do need to get rid of Marcus Seberg if they want to take the stage victory because Seberg himself is a very fast finisher. It's a difficult day this final day here in Nice as Joachim Rodriguez takes the front, but I have to tell you it's been a difficult day since the start. The riders have been over the Col de la Porte, they've been over the Col de la Turbie, and now they're on the final climb of the day, the Col d'Ez, which you can see climbs up to 496 metres above sea level at the top. It's 119 kilometers covered, but then it's all downhill to the finish in Nice. So Munkuche was the man who started the activity today. I would have to say, Bob, for him, it's job done pretty much. This, the leader in the King of the Mountains classification at the start of the day was Christophe Laurent. But David Moncouche has got himself points out on the course, and that will give him the title in that King of the Mountains classification, just as it did 12 months ago. Yes, indeed. He's going to defend that title of King of the Mountain in Perry Nice, a handy little prize for David Moncouche. He was in the breakaway. Those riders are way up the road now, and they're being joined by the attackers from the field, and it won't be long before Moncouche is caught by the field. There's Floyd Landis right in the front of the peloton where he needs to be leading the race and keeping that yellow jersey one more day well look at this rodriguez has gone again this man who won a stage a little while ago in paris has now decided he doesn't want to take marcus zuberg to the summit of this climb 5.1 kilometers to go to the top of the climb he cannot get rid of alberto contador but this man bob i think it's going to be the season for this young man who rides for the case de Spain. Uh, Lille Balearis and he really is throwing caution to the wind any time that he can he's accelerating Contador looking very comfortable we're not far to go to the summit so we'll take a very short break and come back with a lot more action well this is an amazing comeback here Marcus Seberg has been dropped Bob about 15 times but he keeps dragging himself back now let's not forget to, and explain a little bit the profile of the Col d'Ez the Col d'Ez is very steep to begin with for the first two or three kilometers we are now around about three kilometers to go to the summit it starts to level off if you can say a climb levels off and as soon as Joachim Rodriguez sees the return here of Marcus Seberg boom and he's off again no surrender for Marcus Zuberg. He's fought his way back into the front group. Time and time again, he's been dropped at least five times by Contador and Joaquim Rodriguez, but he's clawed his way back into the lead group. He's a very fast sprinter, and he's dreaming of a stage win. This was my favorite part of the cold as where it flattens off before the finish. <laughs> I think it was always your favorite point when it flattened off. Certainly was mine, because actually my best part of the cold is when you go downhill over the summit. Anyway, we're now looking at three leaders. Alberto Contador in there with Joachim Rodriguez and Marcus Zuberg. And not surprisingly, at the front end of the main field, green, white and yellow. That is Team Fonak doing an excellent job for Floyd Landis, who is around about 10th or 12th place there in the yellow and white jersey of leadership. Now, Floyd has been around for a number of years, Bob, and look at the time gap. In fact, it's down to a minute and 25. This season, I think, with the retirement of Lance Armstrong, all of the American riders now looking to take over the throne as king of American cycling. Yes, Floyd Landis is uh, one of a number of great professionals in modern cycling. Levi Leipheimer, a teammate of that man right there, Marcus Zuberg. There's Alberto Contador, a number of great riders. George Hincapi, he's down at the Italian stage race, Tireno Adriatico, this, this week getting ready for Milano-San Remo and the rest of the year. 
but so many good cyclists from the United States now. Leaders in their own right of European professional teams, and Floyd Landis is doing a great Paris Nice. We had one American winner so far in Paris Nice in the history of the bike race last year. That was Bobby Julek. So to have two different Americans going for the win in Paris Nice on successive years, that's quite impressive. And there's Floyd right in front of the bike race, just behind Jos Postuma, the Rabble Bank rider at the front of the peloton. And right alongside him there in the purple and blue jersey of Team Lamprey is, of course, the man who is second place in the overall classification, Pachi Villa. And I would have to say that Floyd is going to keep a very close eye on him. The team doing an excellent job. Team Rabobank moving to the front. They might be thinking about trying to lead the Young Riders competition. That's currently being led by Luis Leon Sanchez of Liberty Seguros. And he's being chased by Luis Postuma for 49 seconds. And again, Alberto Contador wants to try and get rid of Marcus Seberg. Not surprisingly, Bob, they want to do this because if they don't get rid of him before the summit, he's the man that could take out the stage. But look at this battle between the two Spaniards here. Joachim Rodriguez, a very good climber himself. In fact, last year in the Vuelta a España, he was the king of the mountains in that race, and he has dragged himself back up. Spanish cycling once again starting to come to the crest of the wave, and look again. Rodriguez getting right past Contador there. Zaberg just struggling to stay on. He's a very fast sprinter. He might be able to, st to win a stage. He has to go at his own tempo now and not explode himself on the last few kilometers before the top of the cold is. I'm sure that he has uh, the more weight than the two climbers and maybe better handling uh, bicycle skills. There is Alberto Contador. He knows that to have a chance for the stage win, he's got to get rid of Marcus Zaberg. He certainly does, and these riders know that Marcus Seberg will not give up. He might be under a little bit of pressure on the slopes of this climb, but the finish is at the bottom there, and look at that. What a magnificent backdrop. You rarely in Europe get a backdrop like that, and rarely in Paris Nice do you get such a beautiful day as the one we're experiencing here this afternoon. Around about one and a half kilometres, Bob, to the summit of this climb, but it does continue to get a fraction easier, and that could help Marcus Seberg. You get an idea of how steep this climb is when you look down to the coast there down to the Mediterranean. The riders just a few moments ago were pedaling along the beachfront and now they're in the mountains above town and they will sweep down into town for the finish of the stage. Here's the riders in the breakaway. Aitor also being caught by the field. The moment still led by the Rabobank riders. Floyd Land is doing a great job sitting right where he needs to be. Any accelerations coming will have to come from the man in second place, Pachi Vila, the Spaniard on the Italian Lamprey squad. But time is running out for the men that want to dethrone Floyd Landis from that race leader's jersey. Well, look at that. What a great backdrop. Yeah, Floyd Landis leads this bike race by nine seconds ahead of Pachi Villa of Team Lamprey. But a minute and 13 seconds back to Sammy Sanchez and Antonio Colom is in fourth place. A minute 23 back. And Frank Schleck, who was very aggressive on a number of days, is in fifth place at a minute and 23 seconds. But this is the front end of the main field, and they are still very much under the control of Floyd Landis and his men, with a little bit of help coming from Rabobank. As we look here at Joachim Rodriguez, already a winner of a stage here at Paris Nice. And I tell you what, Bob, he could be a very good winner here this afternoon, too. He's actually been professional for quite a number of years. He turned professional back in 2001, and that was for Team Onse. But as I said earlier, he decided to spend more time finishing off his studies. And it's only in the last couple of years that he's really started to come right to the top of the sport of professional cycling. One kilometre now to go to the summit. But again, this is one of those horrible climbs, isn't it, Bob? When you see the kilometre sign, you get to the top of the climb and it continues up for another kilometre or so before you then begin the descent. Yes, it does. The king of the mountains a little bit further down the mountain from the actual top. So a false flat greets the riders after they go through the king of the mountain. Marcus Eberg just about 10, 15 seconds behind the two leaders with one kilometer go to the top of the king of the mountain competition, but about two Ks to go before he can start on his descent. So he still needs to do a lot of work to catch up to the two riders in front if he's going to have a chance for the stage win, which he would have a very good chance if it came down to a three-man sprint. Well, Bob, the main field stretched out into a very long line there. That's an indication that pressure is certainly on at the front end of the peloton. Floyd Landis must be counting away the moment. We were very surprised last year to see an American win. That was on the shoulders of Bobby Julik. I'm even more surprised to see that here we are commentating today on the possibility of an American win back-to-back -back in Paris-Nice.
It's never happened before that two Americans have won this stage race and will have two different ones in successive years, and that is impressive for American cycling. Floyd Lannis, a little bit of the strain on his face there, but riding very comfortably after destroying the field on stage number three. Just absolutely pedaled away from the best bike racers in the world. Only one man could stay on his wheel, Pachi Vila. He got the stage win. I think he was greeted by uh, a few boos on that occasion. But Floyd Landis doesn't mind so much as long as he wins the overall at the end of the day. If it all comes back together, there's an outside chance that Vila could st steal the stage win, the 10 second time bonus, and get the leader's jersey from Floyd Landis. So Floyd not out of the woods yet to win Perry Nice, second American in two years. Unbelievable. What a great start to the season for American cycling. This is Evgeny Petrov. Not surprising to see the Russian rider going off the front, trying to put pressure on Team Fonak, but Petrov himself is a long way down in the overall classification. He's 14th at the start of the day, 3 minutes and 40 seconds down on Floyd Landis. I don't think that's going to rattle Landis's cage. And look at this, Bob. The numbers in that group are really now starting to splinter because everybody is gasping for breath at the back, just hoping to stay on the wheel in front of them. Another attack coming from the front of the peloton. Looks to be the Iles Baleada squad still on the attack. Just there, the king of the mountain for Rodriguez and Contador. But as you can see, just as we said, the, the climb is still continuing in the rider's legs. So they won't be taking a, a moment's breath here until they get over the actual crest of the hill and then the descent into Nice. And a long, fast descent through the town of Villefranche. The time gap's been communicated there. It's about 10 seconds back to Marcus Zeberg and are only just over the one minute mark back to the front end of the main field. Contrador in a situation that he's been in on a number of occasions had a very good start to the season last year with a, a stage victory in the Tour Down Under in Australia and Bob you can see now that Marcus Zeberg has been picked off by Petrov and look at the time gap it's opening up now to around about 14 Two seconds on the line there at the King of the Mountains, and the main field are really not very far behind. Big attack by Petrov, closing down, a, just a, a, taking a minute out of the breakaway, just in a few hundred meters over the, the King of the Mountain there. And uh, Ilis Baleada is still on the attack, but what an, what an amazing move by Petrov, just, just coming over and catching Zaberg just from the peloton very quick. Well, that will help Zaberg a fraction. He'll get a chance just to get his breath back. And it looks to me just round the corner there as if the whole of the main field have come over the top of that King of the Mountains point. So Floyd Landis still comfortably in with the chance of winning Paris Nice to be the second American to win this great race. As the riders begin their descent, we'll take another very short break. Welcome back. The main field comfortably over the top of the Coldez. And in this group we're looking at here, Floyd Landis, looking like being the second American in the history of this race that started back in 1933 to run out the overall winner. And Bob, Team Discovery Channel are taking this descent very seriously indeed because they have got a good chance this afternoon of actually taking the team classification. These are the two leaders. Joachim Rodriguez on the front there, briefly being joined by Alberto Contrador. These are the three chasers. And this might be quite good. Marcus Zuberg on the back, just in front of Marcus Zuberg is Evgeny Petrov. And this is a good move because they're just 20 seconds adrift. But Bob, the peloton are only 39 seconds adrift. We could have a bunch sprint on the final day. Yes, absolutely. There is none other than Antonio Colom, the rider in fourth place on general classification. So all kinds of alarm bells going off now for Floyd Landis. That's a dangerous move. He's just about a minute plus a little bit, a minute 20 behind Floyd Landis on the journal classification. So this is a serious move by Colom on the Iles Baleada squad. He has a teammate up the road. Joaquim Jordi Rodriguez is just up the road. So we can see the rider from Rabble Bank. And they might have a sprinter still left in the field, but a very small group now. And Floyd Landis sitting comfortably so far, but a little bit of an alarm here. If Rodriguez and Colom can get together and take some of that time out of Floyd Landis, they need to get about a minute and 10 seconds lead. And then with the time bonus on the line, Antonio Colon might be the big surprise of Perry Nice. Well, I don't think Floyd Lance is going to let anything like that happen. In fact, Colon is looking for a minute and 23 seconds. These are the two men leading the race, though. I wonder if Alberto Contador is wondering about what... And in fact, the information coming forward, Bob, there is communication now. It's a pity we can't hear into what's going on, but he's probably hearing about the fact that he's got a teammate behind. And that would indicate to me that he will probably stop sharing the pacemaking. He'll sit on the wheel of Contador. Contador might not know that uh, there's another Iles Baleadas rider coming, coming in between the two groups, the peloton and the leaders. 
and uh, Cologne doing a good job. But on his wheel is Marcus Aberg, one of the fast men of the bike race. There is Cologne right there trying to make the juncture with Petrov and Zaberg. Zaberg just hanging on enough, and he might come back to the front for about the seventh time in the last 10 kilometers. That's very impressive riding. Well, there is now 15 seconds between this group of three riders and Floyd Landis, and the position of Antonio Colom in that group may well be causing a few moments of worry for the man who leads the race, Floyd Landis, because he is fourth in the overall classification. Colom at a minute and 23 seconds. But Bob, on a descent like this, at speeds approaching 40 miles an hour, it's very difficult to open up a gap of a minute and 23 seconds, which is exactly what he's looking for. Well, as we rejoin the two leaders, we're not too far away from the outskirts of Nice, and the fact that the cars are moving away, I think it's all gonna come back together very shortly. So we'll take a very short break. Don't, don't, don't go too far away. Welcome back. These are the three chasers and look at the time gaps in the race here at Nice. We're eight and a half kilometers or around about five miles to go to the finish. There is the main field that contains Floyd Landis, the man who's looking to win this race at the end of the day. The man challenging him in the black jersey on the front is in fourth place overall, Antonio Colom. And I don't think that Team Fonak are panicking at all. I think they've got this race pretty much under control. Fantastic riding by Team Fonak, Antonio Colom. A little bit dangerous to Floyd Landis's lead starting the day at a minute and 23 seconds behind Floyd Landis, the race leader. His teammates are bringing the three breakaway, including Evgeny Petrov, and an early morning breakaway. That's Marcus Zaber from the Gerolsteiner squad just on the back of those two riders. There's still two men in front of the bike race, and that is Jordi Rodriguez and Alberto Contador from Liberty Seguros. Here is the peloton being led by both the Discovery Channel team and the Phonak riders. Here's our two leaders. If they catch the three in between, they might hesitate for a moment and give these riders a chance to get a little bit closer to the finish line. But once they smell blood, the peloton is hard to stop. Well, it's like the charge of the light brigade coming down here. 40 miles an hour we're doing at the moment. These are the three chases. But, Bob, the whole of this race that we're concerned about is really only in about 25 seconds. Those are the three chases. And if we could just see around the corner, it won't be very long before you see the green, yellow, and white jerseys of Team Phonak charging down here on the front there there you can see in fifth position is floyd landis he doesn't look like a worried man to me no not at all he's just sitting right on the wheel of pachi vila the second place rider nine seconds behind pachi vila not known as a very fast sprinter but when you're trying to win a stage race and you have a 10 second time bonus and you're only nine seconds behind i'm sure he throws caution to the wind and tries with everything he has to win the stage. We'll see what happens when they catch the three just ahead. That's the second group out on the road. They're still chasing the two riders in front, Rodriguez and Contador. Well, they're all trying to come back together. It's a major scramble here. We're just going through the little town of Villefranche, around about seven kilometers to go now. These are the two leaders, Joachim Rodriguez on the front. He's chatting to the team manager behind. What's going on? Please tell me, are we going to survive? The answer is no, because there are the three chasers. As we get into the outskirts of Nice, Bob, this group is going to form a five-man leading group, but the main field are only 20 seconds in arrears. They're just behind the riders in front, have just gone through this tunnel, and here comes the peloton charging hard on the wheels of the breakaway just before the finish in Nice. Well, I tell you what, they are holding on to around about five seconds advantage, the two leaders over the three chasers, Petrov, Zaberg and Colom, and only as we see the junction here, about 20 seconds over the main field. We'll take a very short break now, leave the five leaders, and we'll come back with the action and the finish. the mop. Someone must fill his shoes. The greatest riders in the world are about to collide. One by one, the contenders will emerge. From the cobblestones of France to the mountains of Italy, who will be the next king of cycling? Cyclism Sundays, the clash of the contenders. Milan San Remo, Sunday at 5. Brought to you by John Hancock. 
Well, charging down now into the outskirts of Nice. And Bob, this is all going to go down to the wire. Three kilometres to go in a moment. They'll sweep past the old port of Nice. They are being chased by a very select group of riders. The difference in time between the leading group of five and the Floyd Landis group there, and there is Landis in the yellow and white jersey of leadership, is a mere 15 seconds. Can they do it? This is a very dodgy situation for Floyd Landis. He wants the breakaway to succeed so the riders take away the time bonus possible for Pachi Vila, who's in second place nine seconds behind, but he doesn't want to give away enough time to, David, to Antonio Colom, excuse me, the rider in the front of this breakaway. He's the Iles Baleada Spaniard. He's a minute and 23 seconds behind on the day if he gets the time bonus for the stage win. They need to stay within about a minute of the breakaway. So uh, Floyd, I'm sure, has got his calculator working overtime now, trying to let this breakaway stay away, but not by very much, just around one minute's time. Well, this is the old port, and yeah, that's a very interesting point you make there. Antonio Colom does not want to finish a minute and 23 seconds ahead of Floyd Landis because that would create a change in the leadership. But, Bob, he's only 10 seconds away from a podium place as well because he's 10 seconds behind Sammy Sanchez, who is currently in third place. It's Rabobank doing an awful lot of work on the front end of the main field here. Look at that for a magnificent backdrop. The old port of Nice. We are looking here at the final few metres of this race, Paris-Nice, the race to the sun. Been run since 1933 last year, and America won this event for the first time ever. And we are now wondering whether an American is going to win it for the second time, and that would be absolutely remarkable. That is Colom on the front. That is Rodriguez. Coming up next is Petrov. A little bit further back, you've got Marcus Seberg. Let's not forget about him, Bob, because if these guys survive by five or ten seconds off the front end of the main field, he could get the win for Gerald Steiner. Marcus Seberg, a very fast sprinter. He's done an incredible job to stay with the climbers on the cold des, and he's still in the front with a chance to win the stage. The riders in the front, just in the last few hundred meters of the spike race, the field hot on their heels. Two riders from the squad of Liberty Seguros have been dropped, but one man still remains in the front, and that is Alberto Contador. Here's the field, very small group. Here's the one kilometer to go. Two riders from Iles Baleadas. That'll be good for the breakaway to stay away, but it looks like Antonio Colon is still trying to steal the jersey from Floyd Landis. He needs a big hesitation from the group, and Zaberg looking for the stage win. Oh, Bob, there's absolutely no way that Colom is going to do that. He might snatch third place away from Sammy Sanchez here at the moment, but they dare not mess around at this moment. They're inside the final kilometer. They've got to keep the pressure on because so many times before on the close, in kilometers we've seen in Paris Nice riders play the cat and mouse tactics and they get caught look at Rodriguez moving himself up he's looking for the wheel of his teammate this is a very important move for these two riders from Il Baleares but I think they're going to survive because the main field is still hovering at around about 20 seconds Evgeny Petrov there in third position Marcus Abera you can see him taking a few deep breaths before he starts his sprint and Rodriguez trying to lead out Cologne for the stage win Alberto Contador tacked onto the back well, Marcus Berg in a good position here. He's in fourth. Look at the pale blue jersey. He's an excellent sprint finisher. That man, he's inside of 300 meters, out of the saddle, waiting to make the move. Petrov is now up into second place. Don't discount Alberto Contador, though. He wants to get the win. There's the move by Seberg on the right-hand side. Left-hand side coming right up against the barriers. Big acceleration from the man from Germany there. Seberg is right on the line. He's going to do it. This is a good move, but Petrov is coming back. No, Marcus Seberg, he deserves the win, I have to say, Bob. And look at the main field. There is not a minute and 23 seconds there. Floyd Landis is comfortably in that group, right in the middle of the picture. Floyd Landis there in the yellow and white jersey of leadership. He's only lost himself around about 20 seconds on Antonio Colomb. So as he crosses the line there, it's going to be a win for Floyd Landis here at Paris-Nice. What a great day. The second year in succession that an American has won Paris-Nice. Fantastic tactics being used by the Phonex squad, letting that breakaway stay away to the finish line to take that last time bonus of 10 seconds, giving Floyd Landis a chance to not worry about Pachi Vila in the closing few hundred meters of the stage. Here's some of the stragglers coming across. But Floyd Landis taking Perry Nice, second American in two years. Great job by the Californian on the Swiss Phonak team. Well, that was a brilliant performance all day, I would have to say, Bob. Team Phonak were in control. They kept their man in the right position. And let's not forget, what a great win for Marcus Zubert. He had a very tough time staying with the climbers on the cold des. Unbelievable ride to do that. Was dropped three or four times. Came back on the descent with the other riders that were coming across, Antonio Colom amongst them. And a very pleased, great stage win by Marcus Zubert. He was the most deserving winner that we've seen in a long time of a bike race. Great job.
job by Zaberg to win the stage. Brave man, he certainly needed the win. It's not been a win for Marcus Zaberg since 2004. Well, there you are. There is the man who has just won Paris Nice, Floyd Landis, after a great start to the season with a win at the Tour of California. Added to that, he's got himself the Paris Nice as well. There's a classification. Marcus Seber getting the win ahead of Evgeny Petrov, Alberto Contador up there in third place. Antonio Colom held on for fourth, and it was 18 seconds back to the main field that was led home there by Sandy Kassar and Eric Decker in seventh place. But in that group at 18 seconds, the most important name to remember, Floyd Landis was there as well. Well, I tell you what, that was a very good acceleration coming out there by Sandy Kassar. Even though it was only for sixth place, Bob, it's not really been a great week for the French. The French still haven't found a way to win a stage since 2002 of Paris Nice, their own race. They won't win the stage. That was a Swiss rider, Marcus Zeberg, on a German team, Gerald Steiner, and an American on a Swiss team taking the overall. Look at Chris Horner there, just finishing out the top about 15 or 20 riders. Good little Perry Nice for Chris Horner as well, finishing in the top 10 on GC. Watch out for the old man of the sport, just coming across the line in second place there, Eric Decker. Well, Bob, coming up there to get the honours of the stage, Marcus Zaberg getting himself his 33, 33rd career win, but I have to say, that one has to be one of the hardest. One of the most difficult and one of the most satisfying. Dropped on the climb at least three times, clawed his way back to the climbers, caught them on the descent finally and then was able to follow the wheels he knew he was the fastest man in the breakaway should they succeed to the finish line he did exactly what he needed to do hanging tough on the climb then coming up with the goods for the sprint finish great win he showed instantaneous daylight between the riders behind him when he won that stage great job by marcus Berg. that's how you win big bike races Well, I tell you what, it was a long time since he'd had a victory, Marcus Zerberg. He's had a lot of bad luck over the last couple of years. In fact, back in 2004, he broke a kneecap in the Amstel Gold Race. He's fought his way back. No victories at all last year, although he did finish seventh overall in the Tour of Switzerland. But that win today, the number of times he was dropped on the Coldes showed that this man, at 34 years of age, has certainly got an awful lot of courage. And look at the determination on his face as he charges to the line here. Nobody was going to steal this victory away from the Swiss rider. Well, here we go. This is the provisional result of Paris Nice brought to us by TIAA Cref. Floyd Landis winning the event by nine seconds ahead of Pachi Villa and moving up into third place on the final day, Antonio Colom pushing down Sammy Sanchez into four. Fifth is Frank Schleck, Azevedo of Discovery Channel up there in sixth place. And Eric Decker with a good move today, climbing himself up into seventh. And capping off the top ten, Chris Horner there in tenth place, a minute and 43 seconds in arrears. Well, look at that. Congratulated there by a man who won the Tour de France on five occasions, Bernard Hinault. And Floyd Landis getting himself his third victory of the season, the tenth of his career. And Bob, this has to be the greatest. This is the best win in Floyd's career. He's following the Tour of California where he dominated that event, doing a great time trial there. He went off the front in stage number three and absolutely crushed the field in Paris-Nice. That was into St. Etienne. And then his teammates from Fonac kept him right there where he needed to be within nine seconds of the second place rider, Pachi Vila. But Floyd Landis, what a great ride. What a great start to this season. He is a man who hopes to challenge for the Tour de France overall in a few months to come in July. Well, he hurt a lot of legs over the last few years when he was the lieutenant of Lance Armstrong. And I wonder now that Lance Armstrong has retired whether this man can stand up to take the mantle. But a great performance there by Floyd Landis. And I have to say, Bob, on that stage to saint Etienne, he didn't only win it on the uphill part of the course, he hammered it on the downhill. He was using a huge gear on the downhill going about 50 miles an hour. The last 10 Ks of that stage, there's a replay of today's stage, Floyd Landis, surrounded by his teammates of Phonak. What a great job they did. But Floyd Landis is absolutely on fire so far this year in 2006. Well, with Floyd Landis being only the second American ever to win this race since 1933, Let's just listen to what he has to say about how he defended his overall lead. The days between now and 
and um, that stage in the San Etienne, we did a lot of hard work controlling it. There was a lot of attacks, and I think the whole peloton was tired after yesterday. It was a difficult stage to control, and it was difficult just to ride in the in the group because it was wind and it was always up and down. So today, I was happy that. Um, they took it easy on us. Now I'm gonna go catch up on some sleep, <laughs> and then, then I'll uh, sit down and make a plan. But uh, for now, I, I'm a little overwhelmed. I didn't expect the early season to go quite this well. I knew I was in shape, but uh, I'm happy. I'll sit down and try to make a more concrete plan as soon as I can think clearly. Well, I'm sure he's had a few restless nights over these last few days, and certainly getting his sleep is a very important thing for a bike rider. Anyway, that just about does it for today. Be sure to join us next Sunday for the Milan San Remo Classic, the longest one-day race of the season. Last year, Alessandro Pataki took it home, but Tom Boonen this year looks unstoppable. Plus highlights from Tirreno Adriatico, it's Cyclism Sundays on OLN next Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern and 2 p.m. Pacific. For a complete schedule, log on to OLNTV.com. And I have to say congratulations to today's winners, Marcus Seberg, and of course the American Floyd Landis being only the second winner ever here at Paris-Nice. On behalf of everybody here at OLN involved in cycling and the production, Bob Roll, I'm Paul Sherwin saying goodbye till next week.